I've always wanted to do that. So I'd like to welcome everybody out this morning to our wildlife board meeting on uh, October 3rd, 2019. Uh, we're going to follow the agenda if you pick one up when you came in the room. The meeting is being a live broadcast, so if you have comments and come up, the public will come up to this speaker over here just on the north, and the division will be working from this speaker right here in the middle of the room, but uh, you need to speak into the microphone with your comments and stuff like that. And we no longer take questions from the audience. We give everybody an opportunity to do that at the RAC meetings. So with that, I'd like to start with the introductions from the Wildlife Board, and we'll start down here with Brett Selman, and then go up to Randy. So if you want to go ahead and introduce yourselves. My name's, my name's Brett Selman from uh, Tree Mountain, uh, uh, representing the northern part. I'm Wade Heaton from Alton, Utah, and I'm from the southern region. Carl Hurst, I live in Orem. I represent the central region. Evan Albrecht, Farron, Utah, Southeast Region. Byron Bateman, Chairman, I represent the Northern Region. Mike Fowkes, I'm the Director for the Division of Wildlife Resources. Donnie Hunter, Cedar City, Southern Region. Randy Durth, I live in Vernal, Utah, and uh, represent the Northeast Region. And I'd like to recognize our two ladies over here that uh, take care of the Wildlife Board and the RAC Chairman, Stacy and Thuvo Wood. And then also our guys down here on the side back here that take care of uh, keep everything on a live broadcast for us and keep everything up to date so the public can sit in and share this information. This time I'd like to ask for approval on the, excuse me, I forgot the rack chairs. <laughs> Justin, you want to start? Then we'll go ahead and uh, introduce the rack chairs now. Justin, Ol Justin Oliver, I'm the uh, chair of the Northern Rack. Good morning, I'm Brett Provedel, the chair of the Northeastern Rack. Brock McMillan, chair of the Central Rack. Trisha Dean, chair of the Southeastern Rack. Braden Richmond, chair of the Southern Rack. Thank you. This time I'd like to ask for approval of the agenda. I'll make that motion that we approve the agenda for the October 3rd Wildlife Board meeting. I have a second. All those in favor? Unanimous. I'd like to ask for approval of the minutes. In a second. We'll make that motion to approve the minutes. Stacy, did you get those? I do, sorry. Yes, we have it. All those in favor? Kevin, is there anything on the old action log? Yes, I'd like to have Jace Taylor come up and give us a, a briefing on the Bighorn Sheep, MOU. Mountain Goat Biologist, uh, we have great news uh, about the MOU. So you remember previously in the summer, we got the uh, MOU with the Forest Service enacted. And then just yesterday even, we got all the signatures for the similar MOU with the BLM. So that includes the BLM, the Department of Ag, um, and the Governor's Office, and EWR. So we're really excited about it. It's been a big effort for us. I know it's taken a good while. Um, you know, Director Fawkes and you know, his uh, you know, Director's Office and Marty Bushman and then everyone over at the BLM, over at Plipco, UDAS has been really helpful in getting this done. So we're, we're really excited about it. So things are looking good for us. That was a commitment that we made before we brought Bighorn Sheep to the Mineral Mountains. If you remember the Mineral Mountains um, presentation back in May of 2018. And things are looking good for the Mineral Mountains, so we're, we're feeling really good about it. Ace, I know that was a big effort and from the Wildlife Board. We thank you. Absolutely. Good 
Now we'll hear from Mike Fox with an update of the division. Yeah, Jay stole my thunder on the MOU. That's uh, that's been a hard work in process, and I'm glad we got it done. I want to. I do want to specifically thank Kerry Gibson, um, Troy Forrest, um, Ed Roberson from the BLM, and Marty and and our staff uh, here in the wildlife section for all that hard work and getting that pulled off and getting that done. So now we can move forward. Uh, so it's all good. Let's see, from the wildlife uh, section, the archery hunt uh, reported out really well. Looks like we had um, pretty good harvest, uh, lots of, of nice animals taken. Um, the muzzleloader was probably average. Conditions weren't as good as they were for the archery hunt. Um, so hopefully the, uh, the rifle hunts will be looking, picking up a bit. Uh, waterfowl hunt starts tomorrow, as does the general season elk. Not tomorrow, Saturday, sorry. Some people will start <laughs> I'm missing a day. <laughs> I'm going to take tomorrow off, but I'm not going to go hunting. At <laughs> um, any rate, uh, it starts this, this weekend, Saturday, um, so please uh, take advantage of that. If you have an elk permit, get out. Um, if you don't, go waterfowl hunting. It uh, should be good. Uh, licensing wanted me to report out that uh, Bob Tag Bobcat tags went on sale this week. Uh, remember this year that you're limited to five, and there is a quota of 6460 out there that are available. So, um, sportsman per permit apps open up on October 23rd, so be sure to get in for that. Uh, the habitat section um, wanted me to report out that habitat projects that we've done previously look really good due to the good water year that we had. So conditions on landscape are in good shape. Uh, we have we still have 200 new habitat projects in the queue, so there's, we're still going to be busy going into the fall. Um, doing lots of good work. The fire season was light, but there's still a need for us to do some rehab, although it's not as extensive as we had last year. Thank goodness. Um, aquatics. Um, some good news with regard to June sucker program. Uh, the Prover River Delta project is now a go. All landowners have, have uh, agreed to sell and allow that project to go forward. And what that's going to do is create a meandering Provo River Delta that uh, will be good for June suckers to spawn in. That uh, work should should be starting soon. Uh, should take a couple years to get that done, but that's a good thing that's been in the works um, for a long time, and our folks will be involved in that. Uh, again, with June sucker program, Hobble Creek, we uh, uh, ha had the best spawn of June sucker in the last four years in Hobble Creek, so that's good news. Things are looking up, and we took a thousand June sucker out of the Red Butte Reservoir. Uh, out to Utah Lake in Stockton, adult June suckers. So, uh, some other good news with regard to aquatics: uh, pelican and Steinecker have been restocked with bluegills, thanks to the Northeastern Region for doing a great job on reestablishing those fisheries out there. Um, they're looking really good, and, and we're headed in the right direction. The last thing I'm going to bring up is our law enforcement section is uh, full on into a new hiring go around. We have lots of good candidates. It looks like we'll be able to pick up six or seven new COs. So. Uh, and they're high caliber folks, so we're looking good. And that's my report. How close are we to having 100% in law enforcement, Mike? Rick, best answer is this, but I think seven will get us back to where we need to be. Okay. Thank you. With that, uh, we'll start with the uh, agenda. Item five, and before we get going, uh, what color are we using for the cards down here? Okay. So if you want to make a comment, just go over here to the side and fill out one of these comment cards and then bring it up to Stacy right there at the table. And then you will be using this microphone, like I said earlier, right here to our right. So Craig, if you're ready, you want to come up and give us your presentation. My stacks of notes here. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, board members, RAC chairs. Um, thank you for the opportunity today to present to you uh, the first of two informationals. Uh, this one is, is titled Tailoring Angler Opportunities to Meet Angler Needs, How the Aquatic Section and the Division of Wildlife Resources Plan on Planning for the 2021 Regulation Cycle and Beyond. Okay. 
So first, why is it important to tailor angler opportunities to meet angler needs? First, we've identified the fact that we need to do a better job at addressing public needs in general. Uh, based upon 2018 public feedback through uh, the wildlife board process, we had proposed a fly and lure only regulation removal uh, in southern Utah waters. Uh, that was not approved due to some of the feedback that we received from the general public uh, and an apparent mismatch between that suggested regulation change and angler desires. Additionally, in 2018, anglers expressed concerns over the removal of select brook trout populations and fishing opportunities in Utah and the need for more bait fishing opportunities on more rivers throughout Utah. Uh, the aquatic section personnel, after taking stock of all that, agreed to examine the angling experiences that we offer in the state and compare those with angler preferences. So tailoring angler opportunities to meet angler needs will also help the Division of Wildlife address the potential for angler crowding, which we've identified as a, as a pretty critical issue coming up here. Uh, the forecasted Utah population growth is expected to be uh, increasing from 3.2 million residents to 5.5 million residents by 2050. Uh, we all know that's, that's happening. We see it around us. Uh, at the same time, we are experiencing what we would term stable angling participation per capita in the state of Utah. You put those two together and you see on this graph, we're, we're looking at a situation where we're going to end up with a 7% increase in the number of anglers out in the landscape by 2025, 26% increase in anglers by 2040, and an anticipated 39% uh, increase in anglers by 2050. The reason why this is critical is the perception of crowding is identified consistently, not only in Utah, but nationally, as one of the main reasons why anglers cease participation in fishing. We've got to figure a way to manage opportunities on the landscape to allow for uh, at least the perception of crowding to be minimized or mitigated as much as possible. Further, making sure that we are providing satisfying angling experiences is critical to ensuring the relevancy of angling among outdoor recreational pursuits. Um, and with that in mind, we are going to begin tailoring managed fishing experiences to meet the needs of anglers proportionally starting during the 2021 regulation cycle. So as an example of something that we might do, and this is just an example, if 20% of anglers in the state of Utah prefer to fish for largemouth bass at lakes and reservoirs, we should be striving to manage for largemouth bass fishing opportunities at 20% of our lakes and reservoirs in the state. Um, excuse me. So in addition to that, we need to make sure that we are ensuring that the unique ways anglers participate in the sport of fishing don't conflict with one another. Um, you've all experienced outdoor recreation on the forest, um, and in those situations, uh, recreational users that, for example, use off-highway vehicles versus those that use foot and horse traffic are not crammed into the same areas uh, using the same trailheads they're actually parsed out and segregated to a certain degree. And we're looking to uh, employ that methodology, again, to address conflict and the perception of crowding among our anglers. So now we know a little bit about the why behind what we're trying to provide uh, in the way of opportunities for anglers. How do we propose that we get there? Well, in 2017, we surveyed more than 10,000 anglers via email, and those surveys were distributed to potential respondents proportional to their representation among all licensed anglers. For example, by license type or gender, we made sure that uh, the opportunity for those groups was proportional uh, to respond was proportional to their representation in the angling public. Uh, we'd like to analyze the responses from that 2017 statewide attitudinal survey to identify angler behaviors and preferred experiences. We'd also like to use behavior and preference results to define what we're terming preference groups among Utah anglers who seek common experiences. For example, uh, a group might be anglers who fish for similar species in similar settings using a similar gear type. Um, we'd like to identify where those angler preference groups are willing to fish. 
For example, in individuals might be, uh, live in a certain zip code, certain area, and be willing to travel two hours for a preferred fishing experience, or three, or four. We've got to identify what their willingness to travel is. Secondly, we'd like to take stock in what our fisheries have to offer through inventories and what we're terming a capacity assessment. So an inventory is simply an identification of the experiences we currently offer out on the landscape. Uh, what we're terming an assessment of capacity is identifying the variety of experiences that each water is capable of providing, not currently providing, but capable of providing. So for example, does a water currently managed for trout have the capacity to be managed for bass, wiper, kokanee? Could current regulations be modified at a water to allow for greater harvest? Could regulations be modified at a water to create a gear specific, for example, fly only fishing experience? Possibly. Could infrastructure improvements be made to increase accessibility for shore anglers? Can habitat be manipulated to create a new experience out of water? Or even can smaller fish be stocked at higher densities to increase angler catch rates at a water that is currently managed for lower catch rates but trophy fish? Third, we'd like to look at the gaps between what we have to offer in the way of fishing experiences and what anglers want. So a gap is that mismatch between preference and offering. Uh, where are the gaps between preferred fishing experiences and experiences we currently offer out there on the landscape? Where are there opportunities to use the capacity, which I defined earlier, of waters as a vehicle to address those gaps? And then finally, what are the gaps that we can't currently address, which will drive uh, the development of new management objectives or methods uh, for future changes? Finally, we'd like to look at willingness to travel. I mentioned earlier, willingness to travel is the distance an angler is willing to travel to experience their preferred outcome. Uh, we'd like to look at where anglers with preferred experiences reside in the state and find out whether or not there are opportunities that they are seeking that are available within their willingness to travel radius. Are we offering the opportunities that are convenient for people to access? So we've been working on this for about six months uh, after uh, the direction of the board kind of pushed us in that, in that um, direction. And I'd like to present to you a few of the things that we've accomplished to date. We've gone through the angler data from the 2017 uh, attitudinal survey and we've assessed angler preferences and behaviors. Specifically, we've looked at anglers preferred species their preferred water type, their gear preferences, and their preferred access method, as well as the time spent pursuing various species, which is more of a behavioral component. With regard to species preference, we've evaluated the strength of the relationships between species preferences, specific species preferences, to define what we term preference groups. So based upon that assessment, we have a Utah angling public where 10% prefer to fish for what we're terming lake salmonids, 4% prefer to fish for warm water fishes or more commonly known as panfish, 8% prefer to fish for bass and walleye, 68% appear to fish, uh, prefer to fish for streams or for salmonids on streams, and 10% really don't have a preference. We've categorized them as generalists. Additionally, we looked at species preference among our non-resident anglers and found that non-resident anglers who prefer to fish for warm water species seem to have a greater preference for crappie. Um, and this will, I'll bring this up later in the presentation as to its importance. We've defined method and setting preferences among our anglers by evaluating the strength of the relationship between fishing method and preferred setting to define these other groups. 8% of Utah anglers prefer to fish at lakes or reservoirs by boat. 18% prefer to fish at lakes or reservoirs via the shoreline. And 74% are lumped into a broader group that are termed wading, where they're actually pursuing, using their own locomotion, uh, the fish, whether it be on a shoreline, whether it be uh, along a river's edge, doesn't matter. We've identified the gear preferences among our anglers. In their survey responses in 2017, anglers indicated their preference for particular fishing gear as follows. 22% preferred to fish with lures, 
28% preferred to fish with flies, 46% preferred to fish with bait, and 4% preferred to fish with some other terminal tackle. So most importantly, we've gone in and taken the next step to assess the relationships between uh, these preferences. So in, this is in an effort to try and figure out what experiences anglers are wanting. In this case, we showcase the relationship between species preference groups and gear preferences. And you'll notice, uh, I don't have a pointer here, but you'll notice that in the top left quadrant, those anglers that prefer to fish for bass and walleye and those anglers that prefer to fish for lake salmonids use lures. Uh, warm water anglers and generalists in the lower left prefer to fish with bait. Those that prefer to fish uh, for stream salmonids prefer to fish with flies. What we're noticing as we develop these relationships is the underlying why these relationships are popping up. And based upon our knowledge as we start to go into this, you'll notice that the y-axis looks, looks like it's being driven by what we term gear investment. So warm water anglers and generalists fishing for bait are putting forward less of an investment into the sport of fishing to access the sport than those that are actually pursuing, maybe by boat, uh, bass, walleye, lake salmonids using lures. So there's more of an investment as you go up that y-axis. Also, I'd like you to notice as you move left to right on the x-axis, we move from lake orientation to stream orientation as we develop these relationships. We've also looked at the relationship between angler gear preferences and their preferences for access methods at a particular setting. Again, top left quadrant, we have those that fish uh, at lakes via a boat, preferring to fish with lures. Bottom left quadrant, those that fish from lakes on the shore, preferring to fish with bait. Those that are awaiting anglers, preferring to fish predominantly with flies. Um, Again, the x-axis moving left to right, moving from lake reservoir to stream. Uh, but if you, if you look at the y-axis on, on this graphic, uh, we're looking at the underlying reason for the relationship again. Mobility is the component here. Those that are sedentary anglers fishing from lake shoreline um, using bait are in the bottom left quadrant. But as you move upward on that y-axis, you begin to have those that pursue their quarry using their own power, wading fly fishing, and then further up that y-axis, you have those that actually use motorized or mechanized pursuit of the fish by uh, using a boat on a lake. So with regard to behaviors, we've begun to examine resident and non-resident anglers' investment of time when pursuing various species in the state of Utah and outside of the state of Utah. What I'd like you to notice here is that among resident anglers, what we're seeing is that the majority of time resident anglers are spending fishing is spent in Utah. Um, it's a pretty good indication to us that although there are issues that we can address as far as a, the, the future conflicts and future need to uh, manage opportunities in the state, currently we're doing a pretty good job of providing the opportunities that anglers want in the state and they're not having to seek satisfactory, satisfying fishing experiences elsewhere. The second thing I'd like to point out is uh, non-residents' large investment of time for warm water species. Um, what it indicates to us, excuse me, is that anglers are coming to Utah to fish for warm water species. Um, that is their, one of their goals. Non-resident anglers. The third finding that I'd like to point out is the fact that non-resident anglers are investing a greater amount of time pursuing bass and walleye opportunities outside of the state of Utah, which is an indication to us that we might not be providing uh, the bass and walleye opportunities that anglers are seeking here in the state of Utah. So what can we do with these results? I'd now like to walk you through a few of uh, the changes that we might undertake based upon the preliminary results. First, we might change our crappie regulations. So I mentioned uh, in one of the last graphics that non-resident anglers are seeking warm water fishing experiences in Utah more than in other states. 
additionally, an earlier graphic that I presented indicated that non-resident warm water anglers in Utah are more likely to prefer crappie. Uh, liberalizing crappie regulations at some Utah waters is likely, therefore, to encourage greater non-resident angler use in the state. And as I mentioned some of these things, there's, there's kind of a, an overemphasis on non-resident um, findings, but that's just because they were some of the strongest findings in our preliminary results. This is by no means a non-resident recruitment program. This is uh, equal opportunity, and we will try to manage uh, proportionally for resident and non-resident users. Second, we might change how we manage certain species in Utah. Uh, Non-resident anglers, as I mentioned earlier, seek bass and walleye fishing experiences in other states more than in Utah. We need to examine largemouth and bass walleye management efforts in other states and compare them with what is being done in Utah. Can we improve our efforts in bass and walleye management in the state? If we can, improvement of our management of those, those species might attract more non-resident anglers to the state of Utah. A third example is uh, how we might address access and amenities at certain settings in the state. Uh, I mentioned that anglers who prefer to fish for warm water species are more likely to fish from shore using bait. Uh, some preliminary analyses that I didn't present here indicate that these anglers are all li also likely to keep fish for food and prefer to fish at locations where amenities are present, restrooms, fish cleaning stations, those types of things. Uh, Right now, and we've known this for over a decade, we really have a lack of developed shoreline angling access sites at Utah's reservoirs and lakes in the state. Um, for those of you that have fished at lakes and reservoirs and attempted to do it by shore, there's no really improved way to access those opportunities. Additionally, outside of community fisheries, there are no fish cleaning stations tailored to the needs of shoreline anglers anywhere in Utah. Um, and when you combine that with, you know, a group of anglers that are more harvest oriented, it's kind of a, a mismatch there. So we believe that improving shoreline angling opportunities will address the needs of an underserved portion of Utah's angling public. And that's a third example of something we might do. So after the examples that I presented today, uh, just to kind of run through of where we're going from here. Next steps we've got are to continue uh, some of the work that I presented today, continue of, to evaluate preference and group anglers, create those angling groups from existing survey data from the attitudinal survey, examine willingness to travel among identified angler preference groups residing in certain localities, zip codes in Utah, inventory and assess capacity of existing fisheries to meet the needs of angler preference groups, modify management of our fisheries where needed and where feasible to meet the needs of anglers, address the gaps with the creation of new angling opportunities, examine another survey result. We have, uh, this is the attitudinal survey. We also have a lapsed angler survey where we look at anglers who have not consistently participated in fishing over the past five years look at those results to assess what constraints are out there to angling participation. I mentioned crowding being one of them, but there are probably others out there. Incrementally propose data-driven regulatory changes between 2021 and 2029 at two-year intervals, which is our now our regulatory cycle for aquatics. Um, present those to the rack and board at two-year intervals. Continue to survey anglers at five-year intervals to assess uh, the changing angler preferences, behaviors, habitat conditions, and increased demand that we're seeing out on the landscape. And also conduct other surveys where we continue to survey anglers uh, to assess the response to management changes that we're making as a result of these data-driven suggestions. So with that, I will uh, take any questions or comments. I'd like to thank you for your time this morning. Thanks, Craig. Is there any questions from the board? You mentioned trying to balance what the, the the public is asking for and what we're currently offering. How, what's your feeling? Are are we way out of whack in that, or are we close? Or, I mean, are we where are we at with it? I, based upon that one graphic that I provided, where which shows that Utahns are actually not seeking um, fishing activities elsewhere to achieve satisfaction, I think we're close. Um, but we're trying to actually be proactive in this approach and. Uh, we did have some symptoms that 
from last year, as I mentioned at the outset of this presentation, that maybe we're missing the mark in some instances. Um, we need to make sure that we're not, we're not putting opportunities out in the landscape based upon our feelings, um, but actually taking the pulse of the angling public and, and making sure we're offering what they want. Um, that's a sea change for us, really it is. And it sets the stage proactively for us to address what I think is coming. Although we're, we're close now, I think there's gonna be a continued mismatch as that public diversifies and grows. Any other questions from the board? Yeah, Craig. Uh, you guys have got a world-class fishing here in Utah. It's better fishing now than I've ever had in my whole life. I worry about these changes that you're wanting to make. Everybody's happy. If they're out there catching fish, they're happy. It's a good, good for families. They go out, they catch fish, they're happy. So be careful with some of the things that you're wanting to change. It kinda, kinda concerns me a little bit. Absolutely. I, I can maybe see a little bit with the warm water, uh, and a lot of that's in southern Utah, yeah. We probably need some more, but let's be careful and not ruin what great program we have. Thank Absolutely. you for all the hard work you guys have done. Thanks, Tony. Greg, you identified a couple of gaps uh, with relationship to non-residents. And I'm just curious, do we have a feel for what percentage of our anglers are non-resident? Uh, Kenny, <laughs> uh, I think that we are, I wanna say 10%. Is that a fair figure? Any other questions from the board? Rack chairs, do you have any questions? You did a good job, Craig, so thank you. Randy, are you ready to come up? I have. Oh, excuse me, okay, you got one more. Remember, this is my first time doing this, so. <laughs> I like to move things along. <laughs> Okay, so the second informational that I'd like to present to you this morning is uh, a discussion of how we plan on simplifying certificates of registration for fishing tournaments in the state. So before we get there, some background on certificates of registration in general. For those of you that don't know, a certificate of registration is a special permit that covers certain wildlife related activities. People who want to participate in activities that require a COR currently apply for their permit using a paper application, download it at the DWR website as a PDF. Those paper applications are then submitted and reviewed by regional and Salt Lake office DWR personnel and then approved or denied on a case-by-case -case basis. Fairly cumbersome. Um, we examined this process, uh, the COR process, a couple of years back just to, to critically evaluate how well it was working. Uh, we assess that the public is pretty dissatisfied with what they view as a flawed certificate of registration application process, not the COR process itself, but the application process. Um, we also identified the fact that review of our COR, COR applications is indeed cumbersome and time consuming for DWR personnel. Uh, as a result of that time consumption, there is a large backlog often of CR applications awaiting approval. Uh, that's not uncommon. And for all those reasons, the Division of Wildlife Resources specifically, uh, Director Fawkes, wanted us to create a more efficient CR application process for a variety of our CORs that we offer. One of the first efforts um, that we're gonna undertake is to begin creating greater efficiency in the COR application for fishing tournaments. Uh, this application process would provide guidance to applicants regarding the eligibility of their request. It would address rule requirements as they relate to AIS certification, number of participants, 
prize value, live weigh-in, species, adherence to fishing regulations, all the things that are written in the rule associated with the COR. It should be noted that the primary function of the fishing tournament COR is to prevent scheduling of multiple tournaments at a water on the same day and to minimize conflicts with non-tournament anglers. It's primarily social in nature as far as a, an application or permit. Um, the online application that we're proposing would address conflict by not allowing tournaments to occur on any of the following days, holidays, free fishing day, any location or date determined by the Division of Wildlife Resources or other managers, for example, state parks, to be ineligible due to potential conflict with management or social needs, or a date at a location already secured for another fishing tournament. As I mentioned before, this application process would provide guidance to applicants regarding eligibility of their request and rule requirements. So what I'd like to do now is walk you through some scenarios. This was put together, a mock-up was put together by our DTS folks. Um, and what you see here would be, is a mock-up of what would be the faceplate where you would enter your initial information. And from that uh, entry portal, you would then go to a variety of destinations based upon the information you entered. So the first scenario I'd like to walk you through is one in which the information entered results in what we term a date collision. So after the information is entered, the applicant would be informed that they do, need author they do indeed need authorization for their tournament, but the dates they've chosen are in conflict with other tournaments that are occurring at a water body. Uh, they would be prompted to choose another date or choose another water body from a list. Once they go through that process and get to a point where they've chosen a water body that doesn't have conflict, they would be prompted to add additional information regarding their tournament, specifically about the tournament director, the tournament organization, the rules for the tournament, et cetera. And in the case of boat use during a tournament, they would be required to sign off as the tournament director uh, for AIS uh, certification stipulations. Once they've done all that, they would be prompted to go to a payment screen, asked to submit their payment. Once they submitted their payment, they would be provided with an authorized COR for printing for the tournament director, as well as uh, delivery via as electronic in an electronic format via email. The second scenario is basically the exact same thing, except it doesn't involve a conflict. So they get this notification right up front. Yes, their COR, their tournament does require a COR. Uh, they will need to complete the registration, which they'll be walked through, and there'll be a $10 fee to complete that registration process. As before, they'll enter in additional information about their tournament. They'll be asked to, in the event that they are using a boat, to provide uh, agreement for the rules and stipulations related to AIS and sign off on that. Go to the payment screen and then they'll be able to download their COR. The third one and probably the most important one that we're addressing with this automated process is the, uh, the result where no one, you're not required to have a COR. Um, this is not considered to be an eligible tournament that requires a permit. Um, right now, applicants that are putting in these type of applications, I mentioned the backlog earlier, they're filling out the application, they're sending it in, we're having to invest time to review it, and then we're taking a long time to get that information or the result back to the applicant, and the end result is you don't need a permit. So there's a lot of work that's being done for no apparent reason. Um, with the automated system, we would be able to have the upfront information entered and that individual would be notified immediately, real time, you don't need a COR for what you're talking about. Go ahead, go have fun, as DTS puts it here. And then the final scenario is a tagged fish tournament. So the Division of Wildlife Resources main, maintains oversight for tagged fish tournaments. Uh, we will continue to do that. Um, but what we want to do is ensure that applicants that are wanting to do a tagged fish tournament 
are directed to contact the proper people. Um, and they are asked at this point in time, having indicated that they are going to conduct a tag fishing tournament to confer with their regional DWR representative to work with them to schedule a time and pay their fee for that tournament. Um, I think this one is, is critical. Uh, something that you'll be hearing in an informational probably next year uh, is our effort to emulate what Idaho is doing uh, with the use of tags to assess harvest of their fish uh, to aid us in uh, development of a proper stocking regime for those fisheries. Um, I think this is going to be key for us to uh, assess that through tagging. So that's what the mock-up looks like. What's coming soon is the activation of an actual functional application portal for the fishing tournament COR in 2021. Uh, in addition to the application itself, it will include the creation of a monthly report. Uh, and this is thanks to Amy Canning. She brought this up in our early review of this. Uh, we'll include the creation of a monthly report that identifies tournament dates and locations for web publication. Um, for those of you that may know about tournaments elsewhere in the country, uh, it is often a spectator sport for some. Um, in the event that people want to come watch a tournament, this would be a way for them to access information as to where tournaments are taking place. For others that want to avoid the conflict related to tournament angling that they perceive, this would be a way for them to avoid those locations and those dates where tournaments were taking place. In addition to the application itself, we do plan on proposing uh, a rule modification for the fishing tournament COR in the fall of 2020 to the rack and the boards. Uh, historically, the fishing tournament COR was designed to prevent overharvest and mortality of stocked fish. As I mentioned right now, it's more of a social uh, permitting process. And there's really no evidence at this point in time, as we've conferred with our regions, that fishing tournaments are biologically impacting uh, fisheries in Utah. What we'd like to do is propose a change that will meet the needs of modern anglers, uh, possibly allowing for uh, greater tournament angling and enlist tournament anglers as conservationists in the state of Utah, as they are elsewhere in the country, as well as modern management needs, um, as I mentioned, the tagging issue earlier. So hopefully we'll be able to put forward something that uh, you all will approve of and uh, will meet our, our angler and management needs. With that, I'll take any questions or comments. Any questions from the board? And Chairman, I got a couple. I, I think this is really good. I, I really like the uh, uh, the streamline of this, and I can understand the uh, COR process, how, how it could really get bogged up at times with the, the legwork that uh, you folks have to go through. But I do have a couple questions. First one, I, I guess it, there, there are certain times of the year you probably have a bigger backlog than others. When we're talking backlog, are we talking just a half a dozen or so? Or are we talking dozens? Of if, if Anita were here, um, it depends on the COR type. So cumulatively, um, we have probably two individuals, I think, that are overseeing all of the CORs and the applications that come into the Division of Wildlife Resources. Uh, cumulatively, there's a backlog of months worth of work. There are stacks and stacks and stacks because it goes beyond just fishing tournaments. It goes into research related, um, bait dealer related, all of these different permits that we dole out. Um, what we're trying to do is piecemeal automate each individual type so that cumulatively, cumulatively we have a time savings and a manageable uh, program for what is two individuals that are overseeing it. Okay, thank you. And the second question is, um, how many of these fishing tournament uh, CORs, do you, you get a request for annually? Or I'm, I'm going to ballpark it here. I would say that we are probably in the realm of 100 a year. That's awesome. That, that's cool. Yeah. I really like it. it. I think streamlining the process like that is a really good, good thing for everybody. Thank you. Anybody else have a question from the board? Then we'll go to the actress. So did I hear you say that all of the different types of CORs are looking at automation? Or is this a pilot project? Or So this is, the, this is the second in the queue. Uh, the first that we're undertaking is um, the HERP rule, which you all have heard about. Uh, that HERP rule will entail 
the automation and use of a permit, um, which used to be a COR, uh, as well as some adult learning that's associated with that and certification. Uh, that is one way that we're addressing that COR type. This is how we're addressing the tournament COR type. Um, it's a pilot in the fact that we're, we're addressing it, um, but the methodology that we're using to address it will differ from COR to COR based upon the customer needs. Anybody else? Job again, Craig, thank you. Andy? Okay, well, thanks for the introduction. My name is Randy Opplinger. I'm the Cold Water Sport Fish Coordinator for the Division of Wildlife Resources. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to present a recommended rule change that would basically establish some criteria for aquaponics facilities could operate here in Utah without a certificate of registration. Uh, before I get into that, though, I just want to quickly talk about the Private Aquaculture Advisory Council, the PAAC. I'm going to call it the PAC throughout my presentation. But what the PAC is, it's an advisory council that was established by the Utah legislature back in 2017. It's a 10-member council that rep has uh, representatives from Utah's private aquaculture community, private pond owners, anglers here in the state, representatives of the Division of Wildlife Resources, and representatives of the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food. And one goal of the PAC is to give advice and recommendations to the Wildlife Board on rules adopted concerning the regulation of private fish ponds, private stocking, and short-term fishing events here in Utah. And the PAC also advises on the aquatic animal species authorized for importation or use in aquaculture, aquaculture facilities, fee fishing facilities, private fish ponds, short-term fishing events, and private stocking here in the state. It turns out that the topic of aquaponics came up at a recent PAC meeting. Uh, aquaponics is something that's increasing in popularity, not just here in Utah, but really throughout the world. And uh, aquaponics is something that's not addressed under current DWR rules. So what we've traditionally done is we've handled aquaponics facilities the same way that we'd handled private fish pond under our private pond rule, which is R65759. In reality, however, aquaponics facilities have a much lower fish escapement risk than a private pond because in most instances, aquaponics facilities are what we call closed loop, which means they're indoor facilities. They receive water from a culinary water source and the water is discharged into a sewer or septic system, where in comparison, private fish ponds are outdoor ponds that have some kind of connectivity to a public waterway. So given the fact that there's a lower fish escapement risk out of an aquaponics facility than a private fish pond, what the PAC recommended was establishing some criteria where aquaponics facilities can operate without a certificate of registration. And the DWR was tasked with coming up with some rule language, and we proposed that in front of the PAC, and it was approved by the PAC, and I'm bringing that language before you today. So what we're recommending is adding some language to our private pond rule, which again is R65759, that establishes criteria for when an aquaponics facility can operate without a certificate of registration or COR. So what we're recommending is no COR is necessary, provided that five criteria are met. The first one is that the aquaponics facility is a hobby operation, and there's some provisions in what we're recommending that allow this hobby operation to operate for both personal purposes or educational purposes in schools. Next off, the facility has to be closed loop, meaning again that it's indoor, receives water from a culinary water source, and the water is discharged into a sewer or septic system. Next, all applicable fish health rules have to be followed when fish are imported. Then fish cannot leave the facility alive. And then finally, the species of fish that is raised is from a list that the PAC asks the DWR to develop. So this is that species list on it, or bluegill, hybrid bluegill, specifically the cross between bluegill and green sunfish, red ear sunfish, green sunfish, striped bass, white bass, hybrid striped bass or wiper, largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, channel catfish, yellow perch, fathead minnow, black crappie, white crappie, rainbow trout, cutthroat trout, brown trout, brook trout, tiger trout, walleye, and golden shiner. So that represents 21 species. How we came up with those 21 species are these all species that um, currently have established populations here in Utah in some capacity. So if they were to escape an aquaponics facility, it wouldn't lead to the establishment of a new species here in the state. And on top of that, these are all species that have fish health cer certified sources available. So 
uh, people who want to establish an aquaponics facility should be able to import these fish legally re uh, fairly readily. Now, in addition to those 21 species, we also included all other species that are considered non-controlled for possession and importation under our collection, importation, and possession rule. What we did do is we passed that list of species across some representatives of our aquaponics facility, and they bought into that species list, but they suggested adding jade perch, sleepy cod, and tiger shrimp to that no COR species list. We had some discussions internally among some of our representatives who are aquatic invasive species, fish health, native fish, and sport fish professionals within the agencies, and we discussed uh, those three species. And what we decided is not to add those species to this no COR species list. And our rationale behind it is because there's no escaped wild populations of any three of those species here in the United States. So if they were to be in a facility here in Utah and they were to escape, there's a chance they could lead to the first populations of those species here in the United States. And what we know is based off of some of the environmental tolerance data from these species that these are species that could survive in some habitats here in the state. Next off, these are species that have been raised in aquaponics facilities in other countries, and they have escaped from some of these facilities in some cases, and they've established some uh, populations in these other places. And they've had some effects on native fishes. So these are species that are considered invasive in these other countries where they have escaped from aquaponics facilities. And then finally, these species are known carriers of diseases that threaten cultured fish and fish hatcheries and also wild fish populations. Now, one thing I want to point out is that even though we didn't add these species to that list of species that don't require a COR, there's still an option that would be available under what we're recommending for an aquaponics facility if they want to raise these species to pursue a COR. And if that's granted, there's a chance they could raise those fish. And then more broadly, we're proposing that CORs would still be available for any instance when those five criteria that I outlined earlier aren't met by an aquaponics facility. So when that aquaponics facility is not a hobby operation, in this case, that's a COR from the Department of Agriculture and Food, when the facility is not closed loop, when some of the fish health rules aren't met, when some of the fish leave the facility alive, and when the species of fish raised is not from that no COR species list. Now, one thing I want to point out is there are some species that are of interest in the aquaponics facility that are industry that are uh, technically prohibited here in Utah. And under what we're proposing, those species would still require a variance from the Wildlife Board in order for them to be raised in those facilities. So what I just outlined is the rule as we took it in front of the racks about a month ago. And then what's happened since the racks is we've heard some concerns from our fish recovery programs here in the state. Their concerns particularly revolve around illegal fish uh, introductions, particularly those from illegal aquarium releases here in the state. This is a problem that we have really statewide, but it seems to be particularly severe in the Virgin River drainage. And what these recovery programs and the DWR are interested in are eliminating illegal fish introductions here in the state. So what we're recommending are two changes to the rule that we brought forward in front of the RAC. So I'm going to kind of outline these changes a little bit, but the first one is a slight change in the definition of a, what an aquaponics facility is. And the second one is the removal of Washington County as an area where aquaponics facilities can operate without a COR. Uh, the remainder of the recommendations that we're proposing today are identical to what we brought in front of the racks. So that first change is a change in the definition of an aquaponics facility. So what I'm showing on white right here is the original definition that we brought in front of the racks. And then the red are the changes that we're proposing today. So what we're proposing for a definition of aquaponics facility is an aquaponics facility means a facility that combines fish and plant culture for a non-commercial purpose, where first off, all water flowing into and through the facility is completely isolated from any other water source via a self-contained water transport system. Second, all water flowing from the facility is discarded into a permitted sewer or septic system. Third, the aquatic animals held within the facility are used for hobby purposes only. Fourth, no aquatic animals are transported from the facility alive. And then finally, number five, the primary use of the facility is for food production and not for the general display of fish and aquaria. So that's the first change, this change in definition of an aquaponics facility. The second one is the exclusion of Washington County from having the no COR option for an aquaponics facility. And this addresses some concerns from the Virgin River Resource Management and Recovery Program. And what this change would basically boil down to is that all aquaponics facilities in Washington County, if this rule change is approved, would require a COR in order to operate. So I just want to thank you for your time today. I also want to thank the PAC for their input on the recommended rule change and the, some representatives from Utah Aquaponics Industry for their input on the species list. And with that, I'm happy to take questions if anybody has any. Questions from the board? I have a question. Um, 
after listening to, to Craig's presentation about the the online COR process that they're they're going to um, put in place, I wonder if um, that wouldn't be beneficial, even though many of those that you're suggesting wouldn't need uh, a COR in this case. If they went through that, if they wouldn't, um, if initially if it gathered a little bit of information of their whereabouts, what they're raising, but if it wouldn't help them raise awareness that maybe they don't fully understand um, what what those requirements are, um, just that, just wondering if you th if that would help in any way to to assure that. Uh, um, they're meeting those requirements. Yeah, and I got two parts to respond to that. First one is absolutely, if we're looking at considering this as another COR, just broadly the private pond one is one where we'd have an automated process, much like Craig talked about. That's a little further down the queue, but it's something we're definitely looking at and considering. The second part is right now, we don't have any kind of rules for aquaponics here in the state. So if somebody's looking for any information on aquaponics, we're not recognized as sort of the authority and that information's not out there. And what this rule does is it puts some information out there and some guidelines that people can follow. Thank you. Randy, you, uh, I just had a question and, and perhaps you covered this, but with regard to the definition, uh, both the original and the revised, it talks about the stipulations um, or talks about the definition, and within the definition there are stipulations the, for aquaponics. It doesn't identify COR versus non-COR. In the definition it says you cannot do these things, but would you not be able to do some of the things stipulated with a COR? I, I'm just wondering how that's going to pan out with you're still considered aquaponics under the definition, uh, but it's going to be allowed if you get a COR. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I don't know. Greg, are you here? Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, Greg Hansen, Utah Attorney General's Office. Um, you raise a good point, and the, the setup is somewhat complex because of the way our wildlife code and Department of Ag rules and our private pond rules set up, too. And so, the, the general presumption is that you cannot participate in a, a wildlife-related activity without some expli explicit authorization, whether that's in the code or, or via a rule that, that the board passes. So if an individual doesn't meet all of the criteria exempting them from requiring a COR, they would then need the COR to authorize their, their particular activities. So, um, you may not meet the specific definition of a hobby aquaponics facility. It may still look like uh, you know, a general type of aquaponics that you might find on the internet or, you know, or, or in another state, but whether a COR is required or not is dependent on meeting those explicit criteria in the private pond rule. Um, if you don't meet those criteria, then you jump to our collection, importation, and possession rule where you either need a COR from the division or a variance from the board. Or, or I guess an authorization from Department of Ag if you're a commercial, act, if it's a commercial activity. Anybody else? Could I have one more, uh, Mr. Chairman? So, Randy, um, the Washington County issue aside, what is your thoughts about the revised definition? Do you like it better than the original? I think the definition goes a long ways toward meeting a lot of concerns that we have. Where. Uh, it helps clarify the intent of an aquaponics facility, and it also kind of specifies, you know, really what an aquaponics facility is and what an aquaponics facility isn't. And I think it really kind of addresses the intent of the pack when this rule is created. So, so you like the version that is being presented today, the revised definition, more than the one that was presented to the RACs? I think the revised one's a little bit more clear. Thanks. Anybody else on the board? Rack chairs. I'll give it a, all four, well, four of our racks voted unanimous to approve this. And uh, I guess the southern region for the first time, Braden, we didn't have a quorum. Thanks for pointing that out, Byron. <laughs> But the people that were there were in favor of it. Uh, just, uh, yes, we still voted. 
Okay. That won't happen again, will it, Braden? Unfortunately, I have no control over that, but I don't think so. <laughs> We've had a pretty good track record. I know you guys will do a good job down there. You always have. I have one <clears throat> card from the public, comment cards. Like I said earlier, if you want to make a comment, you need to fill out a card and come up to the microphone right here and give us your comments. Robert Judd. Hi, welcome. I'm Robert. Um, I'm representing the Utah Aquaculture Association, which I'm a member of. Um, also, a producer of, of trout here in the in the state of Utah. Um, just a little bit of background is um, we support the changes that have been proposed by the Division of Wildlife. Uh, we've been working with them through the PAC process um, of trying to simplify this rule. They, along with us, get a lot of calls for people that want fish in aquaponics, but usually they don't want to spend any money and they don't want to go through the COR process. And so it, it really hampers trying to get them fish. And what we find is if they can't get the fish, they're going to get them illegally some other way. And that's what's happening. And this is a good way of allowing them to possess fish in a legal way that will then allow them to grow their plants and do that sort of thing. Um, and so on that regard, the, we, we totally and fully support the division on this aspect. Um, just so you know, this is the first major thing that the PAC has put forth as a unanimous thing um, as far as a rule change or amendment to the rule. And we see this as being the future of how the rule amendments should be and could be um, put forth and, and made better for everybody in the state. Um, with, with one uh, regard, I would like to ask that uh, there be a recommendation into discharging of the water. Um, that was a new part that was just put in, and so we hadn't had a lot of time to look at that. Um, I know some of the people who do have aquaponics right now, um, they're more in a rural area, and their facility where they're actually doing the aquaponics is far enough away from their septic system that they wouldn't have the ability to run it to their septic um, or a sewer system, because there is none. But they do have an open field, like an alfalfa field or something like that, that they could discharge that water onto, that it wouldn't go into any waterway or anything like that it would just be into the ground and go that way that would be my recommendation so thank you director uh, that all you had that's all okay thank you yeah. thanks robert uh, just wanted to mention that w that you all have a copy of a letter from uh, mark de who's the chair of the uh, private aquaculture advisory council uh, in support of this uh of this proposal so just wanted to make make you aware of that Ken you want to come up Ken Strong with Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife. With this new revisal that they've just put forward, we would back the program as, as presented by the division, but it, it must contain that new uh, proposal that they put in today. Thank you. Thank you. Roger Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I represent the Utah Anglers Coalition. It's an affiliation of many different angler groups in Utah and, and fishing industry representatives as well. And, and we too support the proposal as outlined by the division with those amendments. We fully support that, that addition. So thank you. Thank you. I guess I did skip the rack chairs from letting you do your own presentations is what went on in your rack. So Justin, you want to just follow up on that and go through it, and then we'll go all the way across. I thought you covered it well for us that um, we, ex in the northern region, we accepted the proposal as presented it and voted upon it, and it was unanimous. 
in favor of the of the proposal or the plan. In the Northeast region, there was some discussion about cutthroat trout being on the list with the concern of all the restoration efforts going going on of having them out there and non-permitted. But the division was fairly confident that if it met the five criteria, they were comfortable with that. And then it did pass unanimous. The central region accepted the division's proposal as, as presented and it was unanimous. The southeastern region um, approved the re division's recommendations as presented and it was unanimous. But I guess my, I don't know if I have a question, just a comment that if you're changing the verbiage, you know, once the RACs have already voted, our, our, does it mean anything what the RACs had to say? I don't know. Just a com. I mean, you know, just a comment. You want to address that, Mike? <laughs> I think the board can take what the RACs voted on and, and also take this recommendation, added recommendation, and, and do with it as you see fit. It's your call. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah, I'm not opposed to it. I, it was just a general kind of I understand comment, what you meant, yeah. so just. And the Southern RAC accepted as presented also, although I, just a quick comment on that. I do find it interesting that the changes were made regarding the Washington County, and yet we had nobody at our RAC, which represents Washington County, bring that forward. So uh, it's kind of interesting. So a summary of the motions that uh, it passed unanimously, uh, unanimously in four RACs, and then we had one RAC that uh, didn't have a quorum. So if the board is ready to act on this, I'll accept the motion. I would just have a little bit of discussion. I, I, I found it interesting that the, the gentleman um, that uh, ra raises fish here in Utah, his last name Judd, um, mentioned that they do receive a lot of calls on people wondering what they can do. And I, um, I can't help but think that the process that um, Craig talked about earlier that they are using with the, and there was a section where there are many people that submit for the tournaments that maybe don't need but but um, but there's still a section for them to to submit for the CORR process and it automatically takes their information and, and lets them know that they're eligible and I can't help but think that that can't really help in this situation to where um, it can help educate people go through this process may you know a neighbor may say hey yeah you can do it at home but they don't understand that one of the fish species they want to raise isn't on the list and so this would just help in that process so i would highly encourage the division to really work towards getting this to, to where we could do the same process go ahead Wade. just to comment as well um I think Tricia brings up a valid point that we all need to recognize, I think we do, but what the RACs voted on unanimously is not what's being presented by the division. The changes were a little verbiage in the definition and then the, the section about the exclusion of Washington County. Uh, the RACs did not address those issues. That was not voted on unanimously. Uh, and, and maybe just to add as well, I, I think uh, the comments made by Mr. Judd I think they really are valid. I think the, uh, there could be an adjustment made that uh, still has some common sense there. Um, as, as long as there's uh, a dumping not in, obviously a waterway of any sort, uh, drainage of any sort, if we could uh, find a way to drain uh, or to dump water um, that does not, is not, does not have the availability to go in a sewer, uh, to me, that's a, a common sense adjustment that we could probably make. Thank you. Ready for a motion? I have one more question. Um, Randy, can you address, um, with, with Washington pulling that out, um, does that create any complications for, for you guys um, in 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 doing that um, and maybe just kind of talk about what, what that would look like. I don't think it really creates any complications for us. I, there, there's some concerns down there about uh, legal fish introductions. There's an extensive history of 
illegally introduce fish down in that area and having the program have to eradicate those fish. And I, I think what this does is it creates uh, some opportunity for us to review those applications and you know apply a lot of, uh, I guess, discretion when approving those applications to help prevent further introductions on that area or potential escapement. Just one, but all of the same fish that will be available statewide will still be available in Washington. They'll just need to f do this extra paperwork. Exactly. Oh, uh, um, I guess just a comment, but perhaps you could stay there, Randy, too, to talk to it. Uh, I understand uh, the concerns. Um, the reason why Washington County is wanting to exclude itself is to avoid illegal possession and introductions. I do not think anything about aquaponics is going to increase or decrease that. We are restricting the people in Washington County, uh, making them jump through additional hoops, which we're trying to avoid and are avoiding everywhere else in the state to address something that this is not going to affect one way or another. To me, I, this, this exclusion of Washington County does not make any sense with regard to the ultimate goals of why they're asking for it. And one more question, Randy, um, as, as to the comments from um, Mr. Judd about being able to, to have a location, say, as an alfalfa field where you, where you could uh, um, discharge the water, would there be a, a system in place that, that you guys at some level would be comfortable in doing that if they, if they registered that or um, had a way that you, that you guys felt comfortable? That becomes really difficult. I, I think, you know, ideally there are situations obviously where a pond or a facility is being, you know, discharged into a completely dry field. But, you know, we, that the escapement risk coming out of that varies a lot on a kind of a situational basis. You know, the proximity of where that discharge point is to the nearest stream, uh, whether there's any other water in there, standing water, say it's a wet season or something like that. So I think it's really hard for us to kind of pinpoint a definition and keeping it at sewer or septic system gives us a kind of a clear discharge point. Any other questions? I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that we uh, accept the private fish ponds rule uh, adjustments with the updated uh, definition, but I uh, but it, taking out the uh, recommendation to exclude Washington County. I'll second that. Do you have that, Stacy? What that motion is? Your motion is to eliminate exclusion for Washington County. Everything else stays the same. Everything stays the same as presented. I have a second. Randy. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Ahead, Mike. Mr. Chair, I, I just want to say thanks to the aquatic section for taking my uh, um, desires to uh, simplify the COR process throughout the division, not just in aquatics, but aquatics has really taken, taken the lead to work on first the herps rule, which simplified things quite a bit, um, and, and uh, the presentation that Craig made with regard to CORs for fishing tournaments, that's all part of a process to review all of our CORs, make them all simple, simpler to get, and eliminate those that we, we feel we don't need or, or over regulations. So they're, they're doing that and we're moving forward. So Kevin, to, to you, uh, we're looking at a whole bunch of ways we can make that automated and simpler. So we're gonna continue to do that. So thanks to the aquatic section for doing that. This fits right in, this last one fits right into that too. Jace. Item number six is the bighorn sheep. Unit management plans. 
Paige Taylor is going to present that for us. Okay, my name is Jace Taylor. I am the Division of Wildlife's Bighorn Sheep and Mountain Goat Biologist. What I'm going to be presenting now, what we're going to go over, are the Bighorn Sheep Unit Management Plans. Um, a little bit of background on why you're seeing these today. If you remember back in November of 2018, the Bighorn Sheep Statewide Management Plan was taken through the Rack and Board process um, and was approved by you then. With that new statewide plan, there were changes that happened that needed to be reflected in the unit management plans. The unit management plans are similar to the statewide plan, except they get into more specifics to each unit, you know, things about projects and whatever drainage or, you know, some of the history in that herd, that kind of thing. They um, reflect the statewide plan, but get into more of those specifics. And one thing that I think is worth mentioning is that prior to now, the, the unit management plans that you're going to be presented have not been public documents. They have been internal documents that EWR has used to guide management decisions, whether that was habitat projects, transplants, hunting, things like that. Um, but they have not been to the public. We saw an opportunity here to make them public, to get input from uh, the RACs, the board, the public, to help make them stronger documents, to be more transparent, um, and to help us with our management. It's something that we're excited about, and we're glad that we've had this opportunity to take them to you. Um, with that, bringing them to the public. We have received some, some feedback that has been really helpful. Some of them, uh, you'll see the motions from the racks have to do with wording changes. Um, if when we get to that today, you know, we've been really um, thankful for those changes. And if we get to that, we have some, some suggestions for those. Um, overall, though, once these unit management plans are presented to you today, um, and if they are approved, then they will not be presented to the racks and the boards unless there's a significant change to a boundary, a change in the population objective, or if we bring a new unit management plan to you that you haven't seen before. Other changes outside of those will be approved by the DWR director. We have in Utah 19 unit management or management units for bighorn sheep. We're going to be presenting 18 of them today. The one that we're not presenting is the Mineral Mountains. You can see it there kind of south, um, southwest Utah in green. The reason for that is back in May of 2018 that was presented to you um, and approved. Um, there's nothing in that unit management plan that contradicts the statewide plan, and so for that reason, it didn't need to be updated. So the other 18 you're going to see today, um, of those 18, 11 of them are Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep, and seven of them are desert bighorn sheep. You'll notice that even though within some of those units, uh, they're broken up into subunits, and inside the plans it describes um, those subunits and things like that. As I mentioned earlier, the, this, the unit management plans reflect the statewide plan, um, they go into more details, specifics, but they do reflect the overarching goals that the division has for bighorn sheep. I want to highlight a couple of ways that they, um, that they represent the statewide plan. The first one is that our overarching objective is to expand bighorn sheep populations where feasible and to maintain bighorn sheep on a sustainable statewide basis. Another important um, aspect of these plans is that the DWR will not manage bighorn sheep to the involuntary exclusion of domestic sheep. We recognize there's the value to Utah in domestic sheep and in wild bighorn sheep, and there needs to be um, a balance between those two entities in the state. And finally, uh, DWR's goal is to manage for healthy populations of bighorn sheep that provide quality opportunities for hunting and viewing. And getting into some of the specifics of each of the unit management plans, one thing they all contain is a population objective. This population objective is the number of animals that we are striving to manage for in that unit. It's important to note that that can change across time um, if there's changes happens, like I mentioned earlier, they'd be presented to you. But, you know, just depending on what happens in that area, whether it's human development, a fire that goes through that changes the habitat, water development, or a new um, risk of pathogen transmission, any one of those things can change um, the, the habitat that's available and then therefore the population objective. Currently, um, as a sum of all of the unit objectives, our statewide objective is 9,025 animals, and our most current um, population estimate is 4,150. This is what that looks like graphically. That red line up there at over 9,000 is um, the objective, and then that blue line over the last 20 or so years, um, how we've been able to increase bighorn sheep here in the state. So you do see, that obviously, that we're half or so of our objective, um, and we'll get a little bit more into some of the reasons for that. 
But I do think it's worth noting that over the last 20 years, we have been able to double you know, our bighorn sheep populations in the state. That's something that we're proud of, that we hope that we can continue to be able to do as long as we're able to do it um, you know, in the interest, best interest of Utahns and do that responsibly. This table goes over each of the units, the, uh, the 18 units, the objective for the unit, and then our most current estimate of abundance for those units. So um, one thing I think is worth mentioning, these documents have been internal documents in the past. These aren't necessarily new numbers, anything like that. Um, but as I mentioned, they have not been public, and so this may be the first time some people are seeing them. A couple more things that are important about the numbers that you'll see there. You'll see the number 125 a number of times. Those are for our populations that we want to keep um, as small as small as possible by still having enough animals in the population to allow for enough um, genetic mutation to avoid inbreeding. So we feel that 125 is an appropriate number for a over a long period of time um, to manage for. That doesn't mean that the populations that are under 125 are failures or are not sustainable or anything like that. We have other management tools that we um, can use for those populations to hopefully bring them above 125, which we've been able to do in the past, but it is a number that we strive for. Um, and so you can see there um, all of those 18 different units. One of the reasons, the main reason, the most common li limiting factor of uh, these populations that keeps them from reaching their population objective is respiratory disease. Um, I'm sh imagine, I know I've presented a couple times before and you've probably heard other places that bighorn sheep oftentimes struggle with respiratory disease because they are not, um, they do not evolve with certain pathogens that um, cause respiratory disease. And so now that they've been introduced to some of these, they struggle with it. So the unit management plans get into the details of what risks there are for pathogen transmission and how we will mitigate those risks. So they go into things like striving for spatial and or temporal separation. That separation is from animals that we feel have a high likelihood of harboring um, those pathogens we talked about. So wild bighorn sheep, um, to our current understanding of the science, wild bighorn sheep and then also domestic sheep and goats. Um, and then we're also uh, pursuing other research to, to understand best what other risks there might be from other animals carrying those same pathogens. We, along that same line, we think it's important that we employ emerging technologies that help with spatial separation as well as treat herds that have um, these pathogens that we're worried about. We think it's important that we support voluntary win-win agreements. Those are agreements with individual livestock operators that um, have situations that could help us uh, reduce the chance of commingling and pathogen transmission. Uh, we also think that it's, um, but and it maybe worth mentioning with that, we do not support involuntary conversions. I know that was mentioned earlier, but um, I think that's an important note. We think it's important that we remove bighorns or stray domestics that pose a threat of transmission. Um, it's something that we've actively done. A number of our units every year, we're removing bighorns that are wandering that might pose a threat. Um, and so it's an important tool for us. We also think it's important we're aggressive in managing density, sex ratios, and age structure to reduce the um, likelihood of those wandering events. And then also what we do is we sample all of our units on kind of a rotational basis. So all the units get sampled um, once about, we get through them about every five years depending on the need. Um, and so that helps us have a, great under a better understanding of what pathogens exist in each herd. Another one of the things that the unit management plans go over are the habitat objectives. Overall, it's to maintain or improve bighorn sheep habitat to enhance individual herd success. And so that includes things like water improvements, fire management, um, and then also, like I mentioned, that temporal um, and or spatial separation. Another one of the important things that you'll find in the plans are our rec recreation objectives. We think it's important that we increase public awareness and education while working to expand opportunities to view bighorn sheep. Um, as far as hunting goes, the new statewide plan has new guidelines for how we recommend permits. All of the unit management plans now reflect that, which is that we can offer permits, um, we could recommend permits at 12 to 25 percent of our counted rams or 30 to 60 percent of the counted rams that are six years old or older. Those counts are done um, every one to three years, either by helicopter or from the ground. Um, and then it, it's probably worth note mentioning those new numbers aren't just, you know, numbers that we pulled out of a hat. We are trying hard to be aggressive um, with our management here in Utah so that we, we hope that it has the ability to um, give us healthier herds of bighorn sheep or less chance of pathogen transmission. And you could argue with those new um, guidelines that we are arguably the most aggressive state in the West 
or in bighorn sheep, um, states where bighorn sheep exist when it comes to ram harvest. We also think it's important that we explore hunts with variable season length, dates, and weapon types, and that we also explore female-only hunts. And that's only when it's needed on herds that are at or very near their population objective. Most of that is not the case, but in some places we, we do want to be able to use that and plan to use that in the future going forward. That's everything that I have for you. Um, appreciate your time and happy to take questions and comments. Questions from the board? Mace, I got a couple of questions. Uh, to start with, you've done a great job uh, with our sheep. We're, we're really happy with, with what's going on. Uh, we need to make sure that some of the tools that we have in these plans, we need to leave in there because our, our sheep are pretty fragile. We need to do everything we can to keep them healthy. Uh, spatial separation is a big, big thing. That's why we've been, that's why we've got what we have now. It's been one of our best tools, but we need to make sure those tools stay there so we can use them. And we also need everybody to help keeping our sheep healthy, not just hunters, but we need the public, we need the ranchers, we need everybody to help because it's a, it's a tough job to get those sheep back. And, and that's what we all want and that's what will keep us out of trouble if we can get our sheep back and keep them healthy. So thank you. Thanks, Donnie. Sorry, Jace, I'm new and you probably answered this, but uh, you had mentioned that unless there were significant changes to the plans, these plans would not come back to us. Does a sheep plan not have, the statewide management plan, does it not have a five-year cycle like the other species? Yeah, 10 years is how the statewide plan, the bighorn plan is written. Um, and yeah, so if, if there are changes um, at those times, significant changes, then yeah, they would come back to you. But in the meantime, say, um, you know, something changed, like there was a fire, and we wanted to change, a we wanted to put a new habitat project in there, for example, or we lost a guzzler or something like that. We could go ahead, the way that it's structured right now, is that we could go ahead and make that change, add that to the plan um, without having to take it back through the rack and board process. Um, director Fowkes or the DWR director could approve that. Okay, so so uh, even with no changes, it's still going to go back through the process every yeah. 10 years? Yeah, so every, is that, that's how I understand, yes. Okay. Every 10 years, yeah. They do have an expiration date. Yeah, just, um, I couldn't remember in the, the statewide plan or in these individual plans, is there, um, with the fear of the pathogen transmission, is there anything in there with baiting for sheep? Yeah, no, so baiting for bighorn sheep is not illegal. I, I, there's nothing that says that you cannot. Um, it's not a common practice for bighorn sheep um, hunting or viewing or anything like that. But no, there is nothing that prohibits it. Any other questions from the board? Back chairs. Would you like us to go through our our discussion locally at this point? Let's start with that uh, the rack chairs report on your motions, and we'll break it up. We'll start with Braden. Go the other way. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we really only had. Uh, uh, a fairly limited discussion, and the concern was brought up that in the plan it mentions that sheep were the cause of the die-off on Antelope Island, and so our motion reflects that. So we made a motion to accept the plan as presented, but change language in the Antelope Island plan to more accurately, accurately portray what we know regarding the cause of the die-off and to add language to the statewide plan addressing education regarding respiratory disease to explain education beyond just sheep producers. Um, so also for pack animals, backyard herds, et cetera. And that passed four to one. Uh, the one opposed, just a comment to that, he was not opposed to the plan. He was just opposed. He, he felt like the plan was good as was without that additional amendment. Thank you. So the Southeastern RAC uh, made a motion to strike comments within the management plan pertaining to the speculative transmission of disease on Antelope Island. And I noticed that the Northeastern RAC did the same, so he'll speak to that. And we did pass that um, base eight in favor and one abstention. 
Um, there, Brett Bailing was there from the Utah Farm Bureau to support that same comment, and so I wanted to note that. And then we did have some just concerns about the verbiage um, relating to the Book Cliffs Rattlesnake snake Unit, but I think the Northeastern, East, sorry, Northeastern Rack is going to address that in a motion. And so we accepted the remainder of the management plan as proposed, and that was Thank unanimous. You. Uh, the central region had significant discussion about the plan, uh, many questions and a lot of discussion. The one thing that we did discuss was the proliferation, proliferal use of pack animals such as goats in sheep habitat. However, after all the discussion was done, uh, the motion was made to accept the plan as presented and that was passed unanimously. Thank you. The Northeast Rack also had a, a lot of discussion it was primarily brought up by our agricultural representatives and our elected official, who's also a county commissioner agricultural uh, producer. And so on the Antelope Island issue, um, the recommendation was to remove the, the language speculating the disease transmission through domestic sheep, and that was passed seven to two. The opposition to that was that they felt it was well documented that that was a risk and they wanted it left in there as is. Um, there was quite a bit of discussion about the, the comment in the, in the, specifically in the nine mile unit plan about oil and gas uh, exploration or, or activity being a potential um, cause of abandonment if disturbance is excessive. So they didn't have a problem with the fact that oil and gas could be a disturbance, but they, they did uh, have a problem with the, the comment about abandonment could be a, an issue with the sheep. So um, that was uh, the motion there was to um, change the wording as it, as it is in the minutes, um, a little more, a uh, little less directly targeted at the oil and gas with the abandonment issue. And I could read that if you want me to, but it's in the minutes of how the recommendation of what to replace that with. And then through the BLM, uh, we have a BLM representative on our rack, and there was a comment that had came from the Oker Stansbury unit that they didn't, I don't, Jace, maybe you can clarify this, but they weren't sure that there'd been adequate Discussion in the uh, wilderness study area. Is that is that what the comment was? Yeah, so the comment was from uh, Natasha was that uh, We identify in the habitat improvements and water improvements projects. I talked about we get in those specifics uh, Muskrat Canyon Muskrat Canyon is Muskrat Canyon is part of the wilderness study area out there um, And they just wanted to make sure that it was clear that we weren't going to be asking the BLM to do anything that was outside of their policies um, and so that, that's what she was getting after there, and we're all for that. And okay, isn't that our standard protocol? Yeah, it is standard protocol. It was, it was a request just to, you know, we, we never do anything. To identify Muskrat Canyon. Yeah, yeah, just a statement, and we have a statement now that we could put in there that says that we recognize that Muskrat Canyon is part of the wilderness study this area, and we would not be um, asking the BLM to do anything that's outside their policy. So the way the plan's presented to us now, that would cover it, so that we wouldn't have to. Yeah, you could, yeah, you can go either way, I guess. Thank you. Go ahead, Brett. That's okay. And then um, there was another issue with the uh, um, the big the UN Mountain Plan, um, and it was a ba again back to the same disturbance issue. Um, they they would the motion was to uh, take out um, some some reference to human disturbance, and then change it to the DWR recognizes that there may be circumstances that require increased human activities within the bighorn units to properly manage land and resource resources and that was again and uh, it was talking about the wilderness type discussion and activities in the wilderness and it was brought up by the agricultural sector on our board and they just thought it was worded a little strongly that accurate, Jace. And then it did pass eight to one on that. And the remainder of the plan was passed as discussed, as presented. 
Ace, can you answer on that last motion on the Uinta Mountains? That would be covered again under our current plan? Uh, you know, they wanted something a little more specific. Um, in the way that it's currently written, um, we talk about um, how if and when there was um, impacts to the bighorn sheep heard from um, human uh, development or disturbance, that that would need to be addressed, which we, you know, which is already in there. Um, I think that they wanted the word if to be included in there. And then also um, they wanted an additional statement that basically said that the DWO recognizes circumstances may exist where more human activity is needed. For example, if um, clearing a you know, deadfall or things like that to you know, avoid fire issues in the future, I think that's kind of I the discussion went along. That's a good point. I believe the discussion was the beetle kill. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, like the, the removal of a timber they were just worried uh, in that the, the Uinta Mountains. Yeah, so they were worried that the wording in the plan might be used to say that the DWR is opposed to those types of timber removal or just or is not open to different things. I think they just wanted some more some more language along those lines. Does the board understand? Was so has the wording been? Yeah, I mean we the, could. The wording it was addressed, correct? I have I have yeah we have some new a new sentence that we put in there that the the region approves of that we could add to that and we could address it. Okay. If you'd like us to. Uh, that was all I wanted is just yep. to address. Thank you. Chairman, can we just jump back to the the, uh, the uh, nine mile book cliffs? I'd I'd like to get Jace's opinion on on that. The oil and gas comment. Yes. Okay. I'd like to get Jace's. And it was just about the word abandonment. I like I like what they they put they they suggested that which uh, it reads the DWR will work with land management agencies and oil and gas operators to avoid potential impacts to bighorn sheep through mitigation measures. Is that? Yeah. So I could if you want to jump in now I can. Throw show you some of the wording the options that we got here. Just give me a second to get through these maps. Booker Stansberry, nine mile. So here at the end, we added this sentence, more or less. Th there was a little bit of confusion with the word abandoned. Some people were reading that to mean that the we thought that the oil and gas development need to be abandoned, but what we were talking about is the bighorn sheep would abandon. So there was some confusion there, so we cleared that up a little bit. And then the DW DWR will foster a positive relationship with and work cooperatively with energy development industry and land management agencies to implement appropriate mitigation measures of um, if impacts to bighorn sheep arise. So they just wanted that added in there, felt that it adds some strength, and um, that was something that we felt good about and the region feels good about the biologists in that area. So I think that that Jace, that revised wording, that you'd be happy with that then? Yeah, if you, made a, if you wanted us to do that. The board that, decided to go ahead and include that. If the board decided us to do that, then we'd be happy to do that. Any comments from the audience? I've got three cards. Oh, excuse me, Justin. Well, first, we noted that I was unable to attend the meeting, but I did go through our comments and read the, the motions and there was very little uh, discussion on on the bighorn sheep plan um, there was good support from the public who attended and the northern rack accepted the plan as proposed and voted unanimously in favor and there was one other part of that they included the parks and recreation to increase bighorn sheep permits once the population increases or the motion. I can help. <clears throat> so yeah, so there in the northern region, um, it was specifically about Antelope Island, um, is that when we reintroduce bighorn sheep onto Antelope Island, that we explore and pursue the opportunity to hunt it more aggressively. Does that make sense? They wanted to encourage state parks to pursue that, is, is what the, the comment was. Um, in the past, we've always hunted Antelope Island with two bighorn sheep permits. And there might be, the discussion was that there might be some value in increasing that number. And so their comment was more or less to the state parks to, and, and us to, pursue, to work together to pursue that. And we have been in communication with them um, at some level working on that. And we'll see if that is a, is a possibility. Jace, with, the, um, with these new plans, you talked about to, to be able to uh, work with the, the, the sheep that want to move, the reduction of number of, the, of rams on a unit. Um, will that will Antelope Island be one of those units where you would 
would hopefully be able to do that also, or is that only the management of the state parks that would would have that recommendation? Parks has been a great partner. They've worked. They have great biologists, um, great leadership. They've done a great job working with us, and they've always, you know, we've cooperatively worked on what to do to manage that herd. That is one of the things that we hope going forward we can do better is to um, essentially. Antelope Island in the past has always been used as a nursery herd, and it will continue to be. Oftentimes when we remove sheep from Antelope Island, we're taking females. We're taking ewes to go start a new herd, whether it's the Newfies, the Oakers, the, the Oak Creeks, those kind of things. So sometimes we would end up in a situation where we removed a lot of ewes, and there was a lot of rams left on Antelope Island, and that, we believe, has the potential to cause issues. If you have too many rams and not enough ewes, there's more incentive for those rams to leave, um, to, see, to seek out breeding opportunities. And so we want to do be more aggressive, and the park does too, um, to keep those ratios of males to females in balance, if that makes sense. So yeah, that is, a, that is a goal, and the parks has been great working with us in the past. So Thanks for that explanation. Chase, one more question. Where do we stand now if, as far as the removal of Antelope Island? Island. Island. Island? Yeah, great. Uh, things have gone really well. Um, it's been hard. You know, like I said, like we said in the past, it's been... It's been sad and tough to remove all those animals, but we believe that we believe that they are all removed at this point. We've had trail cameras out there all summer, um, and we have not seen any bighorn sheep that we did not know about. We we so we believe that we're in a great great position. We're continuing to check the springs with trail cameras. Um, we'll probably do some more flights between now and we do a reintroduction. But the depopulation has gone has gone well as far as as its objective is. And our schedule for. Yeah. So other. Th okay. More sheep there. Or just. Uh, yeah. So other things that are going for, like I talked about, our relationship with parks. They've been great. They're actually building um, a wildlife fence off the south end of, of the island um, to help prevent any commingling. Um, and then we are going to do some testing of some other animals out there before we bring bighorn sheep out to the island. Um, again, in that effort to learn more about pathogens and what species can carry them. Um, and if all of that goes well. Um, the testing is planned for late October, early November. If all that goes well, we have a couple of source herds um, that are lined up from Montana and from New Mexico, New Mexico that we hope to get in January. Um, and if, again, those herds have to also test um, um, satisfactorily so that we can use them. But if everything goes well, mid-January. Good news. Yeah, great news. Everything's gone really well. Thank you. But Chase. We've got a revised wording I'll for the nine it. mile. A lot of this is a lot of the opposition is specific wording. Yeah. You have those for the other. Yeah. Which other ones did you want to look at? Do you want to go to Antelope Island? Antelope Island's the one that we've heard the most about. All right. So to explain what the Antelope Island, like I said, these have been internal documents, and there was some language in there that we were trying to explain what we thought was most likely scenario, and then also in the context of the plan, we're trying to explain why that fence is being built and some of the, why we're taking the measures that we are to prevent um, another outbreak on Antelope Island. So in explaining that, one of the things that was included is we, we recognize that there was, because of the low lake levels and some of the domestic sheep that exist um, in some of the areas nearby, we felt that, that we included that. Um, but it is 100% true that we don't know that that is the case. And so it is accurate that we don't know it's the case, and so it it was taken, it could be taken out of context, and so it would, the request was to remove it. We're totally supportive of that because it is true. We don't want to do anything that would um, unnecessarily cause damage to anybody. So this is how we have rewritten it. Um, essentially um, saying that, I'll read it to you, I guess. November 2018, uh, pneumonia was detected in bighorn sheep population. The source of infection is unknown. However, low water levels of the Great Salt Lake provided the opportunity for animal movements, social interaction, and pathogen transmission on either the north or south ends of Antelope Island. Um, Antelope Island State Park is working to install a fence around the south end of the island. This will help prevent future animal movements off of the, uh, the island and reduce the risk of pathogen transmission. Coordinated efforts with the most proximate private property owners north of Antelope Island have also taken place to reduce the risk of pathogen transmission. So I think that still does what we need um, and I think also um, meets the needs of the motions. I think three of the racks requested. So we had a great you know, discussions with the folks that that made those recommendations, so. Did you have any other revised language besides the two that you've showed us? Yeah, I mean, anything we can, yeah, any and all that you want to do, based on, but I do have ones here from the motions that were made from the RACs, so. Um, I want to summarize all the northern, or the 
northeast region. Northeastern, yeah, had the most of them. So here's another one the northeastern had a specific recommendation or motion for. Um, this is for the Uinta Mountains. And what they were interested in, like Brett was talking about, um, was if the DWR recognizing that there may need more for more human um, disturbance or activity. And then also just a little couple if or a little word changes there. If disturbance becomes an issue, um, UDWR will work with and support federal agencies on travel management plans and or local and other local, I'm sorry, and other land use plans. Furthermore, the public will be made aware through town council and other local meetings in an effort to get local support to reduce human disturbance if human disturbance becomes an issue for bighorn sheep. That if is, is one of the motions that they were interested in. And then this last sentence was also um, part of the motion. UDWI recognizes that circumstances may arise where increased human activity within bighorn units are necessary to properly manage lands and resources. Okay. Thanks. The last one was for the Stansbury, Ochre Stansbury Mountains. Um, I do have some language, but we're still kind of working on it. There wasn't a specific uh, motion made with specific wording. In the southeastern, it was a uh, recommendation. In the northeastern, it was a motion that we just look at it. Um, but essentially, um, we, if you wanted us to, we could add language saying that we would not do, we would not ask the BLM or require the BLM to do um, habitat or water uh, improvement projects that would force them outside of their policies for wilderness in Muskrat Canyon. And then also, uh, we can add more, they wanted more information about the disease event in um, 2014 to 2016, where we depopulated the herd and measures that we took to prevent that from happening again. So. No problem. Any more questions from the board? At this time, we'll take comments from the audience. Uh, you each have three minutes to come up to the microphone and uh, give us your comments. Spencer Givens, you'll be first. And behind Spencer will be Troy Forrest. Good morning. This is green. Oh, green. Green go. Got it. Uh, Spencer Gibbons from the Utah Farm Bureau. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to make a, just a couple comments real briefly. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Jace specifically, but uh, Justin, uh, early on in this process, a lot of our uh, wool grower community, they just had some concerns. They didn't understand a few things. And and uh, Jace specifically and Justin Shannon made themselves available very much so to, uh, to accommodate some of those concerns. Uh, and, I th and I think we've worked through them, which, uh, you know, is evidenced through some of the revisions they've made. And so I, uh, I certainly appreciate their efforts in that. The Utah Farm Bureau does support this plan with, with uh, the revisions that were made specifically about the uh, Antelope Island uh, plan uh, and the speculative comment regarding the pathogen transmission. We appreciate them being sensitive to that. Uh, people certainly are trying to, just like everybody else here, trying to make a living. Um, our farmers and ranchers are trying to make a living, uh, and they're trying to do those things that, uh, they're trying to be good cooperative partners, I think. And I think uh, uh, we feel like there's an extra effort on the D DWR's part and uh, our sportsman group part, and we hopefully f they feel the same uh, that we're trying to be more cooperative as we move forward to look for op more opportunity for sportsmen and more opportunity for the public, uh, but also uh, balance that, that need with uh, the farming and ranch community. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, I, I think, uh, I'll, you know, I'll close by just saying, um, you know, I, I, I look forward to more opportunities to work together. Um, I, I feel like uh, DWR is being responsive, and uh, in this plan, all the tools are there to, to manage for success, and uh, we certainly recognize that, and, and hopefully we can be a cooperative partner with you as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer. Troy Forrest, Utah Department of Agriculture and Food. I uh, apologize, my voice is kind of wonky today, but 
Uh, first of all, I just want to thank the division for, you know, I sat on the committee that put this plan together and to see them follow through. We've got an MOU now with the Forest Service. We've got an MOU with the BLM. We've got the capability for producers to receive a permit to do a take. And, and I applaud all those efforts. Uh, you know, one of the main reasons I came today is to show the department's support for that language on Antelope Island. That, you know, we don't know what killed those sheep. We can speculate, but let's uh, not throw our producers under the bus in doing so. So we'd strongly support that language. You know, we support the rest of the plans moving forward. We like the way that the, the DWR is engaging the community uh, as they move forward. You know, they're reaching out, the sportsmen's groups as well, are reaching out to ag and, and, and making this a win-win to the extent possible. And if we can do that, not only with bighorns, but with everything else, we'll continue to find success in this state. So thanks for your time. Thanks, Troy. Troy Justinson, Sports from Fish and Wildlife. Um, I'd just like to echo what Troy said. You know, we support the recommendations uh, that the division has with the revisions. But you know, I want to touch a little bit on uh, what has been mentioned here earlier is the spirit of communication that we've had between sportsmen, the division, and the ag world. I sit on more, more committees than I can count, going through different plans, being bison, sheep, whatever. Within this last year, there's a different tone. We're able to talk about things. We're able to tackle some, quite honestly, some pretty damn tough issues. But it's in the spirit of cooperation to find out what works. Hey, how do we make this a win-win? So my thanks to the ag side. Uh, it's far better than it used to be. And special thanks to Jace, dude's a rock star. Appreciate him and on his passion for this and the time and effort he puts into this. So we support this. Thank you. Thanks, Troy. <clears throat> I just want to make a comment too that uh, this represents partnerships from his people we just heard from and stuff like that. And, I think these partnerships have gone a long ways to bring everybody together to get more accomplished for all of our wildlife in the state of Utah. And I'd just like to see more of that, you know, with Spencer and Troy and Troy and other, you know, conservation groups in the state. With that, we'll try and summarize the motions, all the racks. That can be very easy, but uh, one thing we can do to simplify it is all the added motions that the Northeast region made, Brett. If the other racks as you go along, go along with those recommendations, it uh, would make it a little bit uh, easier for us to go ahead and get through this process. On the Center region, they accepted the plan unanimously, unanimous, no changes. The northern region accepted it unanimous with the addition of the parks and recreation. That's two that were unanimous. They're, they were all unanimous with the exception of the amendments that were made. The southeast region was to strike the comments, you know, Antelope Island motion passed eight to one. But the main thing is the motion passed unanimous, like I said, for the plan itself. Northeast region, again, was unanimous on the plan with the exception to the changes that we've all talked about. Does anybody on the board have a question on those changes that have been made? We'll incorporate those into the proposal if that's what you would like to do how do you want to handle this to I can make a motion make the motion that we accept the bighorn Utah bighorn sheep management plan as presented with the with the revised language on the specific units brought up at the racks I'll second that we have a motion and a second Questions on the motion? Can we just have a little discussion? Um, I just also wanted to uh, just express appreciation for all the cooperation. This really, this really is a little different climate and uh, a little different tone that we hear from everyone. And I do, uh, I really just really appreciate the effort that's gone into that uh, on all sides of it. 
uh, we're talking about changing a few words in a plan, and it seems like we're splitting hairs. Uh, but these plans and the words in the plans can create an underlying tone and, and an undercurrent that years down the road does have serious implications. So I do think it's important that we uh, are making these changes, that there is this cooperation uh, and, uh, and, and for no other motivation other than that. Uh, I do think it's important we make these changes. I, I support uh, where we're at. Brett, go ahead. I just want to comment as well. Um, I sat on that uh, Bighorn Committee, and I've sit, sit on other committees too in the past, and uh, this mood, this change that's, over, that's taking place, like Troy was talking about, uh, it, it's, it's huge, and it's spilling over into other problems with other things and uh, and this spirit of uh, cooperation is is a neat neat thing to witness and so and it's kind of I don't know maybe Jace got the ball rolling or I don't know who to blame for all this but it's a good it's a good thing and and I compliment all those that need complimented on this spirit of cooperation anybody else I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Unanimous? You got all that, Stacy? As <coughs> to what those amendments were and everything in there. Yes. Thank you. We'll move on to our next agenda item, number eight, conserva conservation permit audit, Kenny Johnson. Stacy, will we have access to that revised wording? We, will that be in the packet so that I can share that with our RACs? Uh, they'll be published on our website. Okay, okay, perfect, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Board members, RAC chairs, members of the public, I am Kenny Johnson, the Admin and Services Chief here in, in Salt Lake. And each year we bring you the, the results of our, our conservation efforts in, in the form of, of this audit, and it will be brief, so um, let's just jump right into it. So those unfamiliar with the program, the way it works, there's a small percentage of permits that are awarded to our conservation partners. Um, these conservation partners and, and permits bring in critical revenue for wildlife and habitat projects. The partners even more specifically help us with a lot of stuff on the ground, stuff that sometimes we can't get to. So the, the manpower is awesome and it, and it helps us to, to do more out there on the landscape. And so I wanted to thank them for, for kind of working through the audit process with us this year and, and my staff internally for, for their professionalism and, and promptness in handling all this and helping us work through the, the, the audit this year. So this year, 326 permits were awarded to the, to the groups. These permits are marketed and auctioned off to maximize their return for wildlife. And this year they generated about four and a half million dollars. The revenue is split up in the, in the bullets here on this slide. The, um, the revenue is all used for division approved conservation projects in those following Ratio. So 30% returned directly to the division, 60% retained by the group for division approved projects. And then the groups, there's a lot of moving parts and overseeing the admin of this, and so they keep a 10% a of that for administrative assistance. New in 2019, we've kind of talked a little bit today, more than once, about some technological changes and some differences and and this is another one, and appreciate Mike and the director's office supporting us on, on some of these. That first bullet, uh, August 15th is now the deadline for audit documentation and checks, and in, in the past, it's always been September 1st. Um, that, that went into effect in July, and so we weren't on the same page this year, so I'll, I'll talk in a minute about, about uh, this year's deadline, but um, moving forward, August 15th is the, is the deadline. Uh, we introduced a new system. This was 
this is probably a long time coming. I think we've talked about this for, for years now. Uh, we introduced a new system to manage the vouchers and permits electronically and allow those to be, be redeemed via the internet and online. And, and that's really made this a lot more efficient on the redemption side. They can, they can do that online before they ever get to Utah and not panic on a Saturday night when the office is closed and, and all of those good things. So we, we're making some good, some good headway in that direction. The audit content, we essentially review four major things. The expend, we make sure the expenditures for the projects approved by the division um, are approved by the division before any of the work starts. We make sure the funds are kept separate in federally insured bank accounts. Um, we look at the permit prices reported at the banquet and then match that to what was actually collected. And then we look to make sure that the invoices we send are paid on time. And so after all of that, what did we find this year? Things were really positive. So 100% compliance with project approval. All the funds were verified in separate and secure bank accounts. We looked at 147 of the permits uh, to compare that auction price to the payment, and they were all in compliance. And all of the invoices that, that we sent out were paid well, well within time. So like I said earlier, it was a transitional year with that, with that new August 15 date, and, and, and I'll take, I'll take the, the credit for um, some confusion early on. We, we kind of launched into the audit with the old date in mind, and then kind of a week or two into it, decided to try to, to see if we could comply with August 15th this year, and got us on, the, on different pages with, with, with some of the groups. And so a couple of the findings, uh, Turkey, remitted their 30% after the September 1st date. That um, was complicated a little bit by, I don't know if you guys will remember, they, they had a cougar permit on the Oakers that the boundary was changed and the, the hunt structure was changed a little bit. And so we actually ended up sending them a check back and then they remitted us a, a new check for that one. Um, Sportsman Fish and Wildlife remitted their 30% after the September 1st due date. Uh, the first happened to fall on a Sunday this year. So we were in contact with all these groups, obviously through the, the audit process. They walked it in the minute they could on the day after Labor Day. So we were never, never concerned about that. Um, and then that last bullet, Mule Deer Over deposited the, their, some of their permit revenue, revenue by about $35,000 and during the process has since removed that and that's been corrected. So our, our real final bottom line recommendations for, the, for this year, let's just all be on the same page, uh, be aware of the new August 15th date moving forward. Um, and then just be, the group should be a little more mindful of the accuracy of those deposits on the front end and that'll, that'll really clean that up. So, and then finally, I'd like to show you guys the kind of the literal bottom line of, of the revenue and um, we can take a minute to, to look at this really the, it's kind of top to bottom, left to right. This is, this is the, the executive summary. And so if you look at the carryover permit column or, or project revenue column on the left, so we started with about 2.1 million. We added additional 2.6 million. And then any interest, which isn't, hasn't been great in recent years, which gives us that total project revenue of the 4.8. And then during the audit snapshot, the, the window in time, there was about 2.1 spent on, on projects in this, this audit year, which leaves us with that 2.6 in the bank account. So they have, a, they have two years to spend it after they collect it. And this just shows us that that process is working well and, and those funds are coming in and going out and, and benefiting wildlife. So that is all I have. Kenny? That number would represent the 10% and 30% had already been reduced from those numbers on that. Correct. Those would be net numbers. Yep, this would be their retained number, yep. Questions for the board? Any questions from the rack chairs? I mean, this is a highly valuable that we have to do all these projects and stuff that we get done throughout the state. So it's a very important program that we keep it and keep it in place. I just wanted like if 
Miles wants to give you an extra thirty-five thousand dollars. Why you don't just keep it? <laughs> <laughs> we would have seen it earlier. We might have. <laughs> you have a comment, Miles? Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> Don Kenny. Thank you. Ready? One up, Miles. Any other comment cards? Um, Miles Moretti, President and CEO of the Mule Deer Foundation. Um, yeah, I like giving you guys extra money. That was just a, we do about uh, $2 million worth of state tags from other states. And with my new accountants and everything, they thought one of the other state tags was Utah. So we got that corrected. But uh, I just want to say thank you to the division for this program. I mean, the as I travel around the West, the, everybody asks, how, how do you do this, you know, and how can we be more like that? And I said, well, there's, you know, just you got to work with uh, the agency and the sportsmen in a lot of states. The sportsmen are opposed to these kind of tags. But but here they're they're amazing. And uh, um, it's a partnership that uh, with all the groups we get together and, uh, you know, selecting the projects is, is really the highlight of this, helping be part of that, sit at the table, um, help develop those projects. Um, right now we're in the process of doing a, a major project on the on the Forest Service up on the North Slope of the Uintas and a uh, multi-year project. And most of that funding is coming from, from this program and through the Expo tag money that uh, we're, uh, SFW and us are able to raise. But I just wanna thank you and thank you for the partnership and uh, and we, uh, I think the other thing is, is I think the transparency of this program that the division has and, and the organizations have put forth in the last few years, you don't see the, the, the comments about this program, the negativity and things that were out there in the past, but uh, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Miles. Troy? Troy Justinson, Sports and Fish and Wildlife. Just echo what Miles said, and, and thanks again to the division. Thanks to Kenny and the department working through the, the audit. We support the findings of the audit. Um, I take responsibility for being the day late, so I'll pay attention a little bit stronger to holidays in the future. But like Miles said, uh, this is a unique program that we have, and it enables us to do what we do. We have the wildlife we have because of this program, so thank you. Thanks, Troy. Any questions from the board? Comment. Comment, go ahead. Just, I, I appreciate the efforts that uh, Kenny and his staff have put in. I, the, re, the audit report, to me, is tremendously clear, tremendously trans, more transparent. There's the feeling that the money is coming in and going out quicker. That's what we want in this program. I hope everybody had a chance to look at the, uh, the project list. I mean, that's an extensive list. There's a lot of good things going on. And because of the, a, a lot of the stuff, we're smarter at wildlife that we wouldn't have in any other way without this program. And so I just appreciate that. I believe it's a conservation story that time will tell is the, was the right thing to do. When we started, it was painful, uh, but a lot of good things are happening. So I, I think we're telling the story better. So I just appreciate the efforts, Kenny. Just, <clears throat> just like to echo Carl's comment there, that, that transparency is key, and that's that's really important. Uh, at times, I think we we get questions about this this program, but but helping us better understand it and keeping the transparency out there is is really important to to the state. So we really appreciate it. It is an awesome program. With that, I'll accept the motion from the board. Yeah, I'd make a motion that we accept that as presented. Our only second? Yes. <laughs> Questions? All those in favor? Unanimous? Thank you. All right, Justin. Just always associate Kenny with the conservation permit program stuff, so. 
the guy with the money. Good morning. Um, my name is Justin Shannon, the Wildlife Section Chief, and today I'm going to give a presentation on Utah's Conservation Permit Program, the annual report for fiscal year 2019. Um, so to begin, this program started in the 1980s, and it was a way to generate revenue to help with bighorn sheep transplants in the state. Um, and since then, it has uh, developed and blossomed into an incredible program. It's, it's regulated by administrative rule R657-41, and over the last 18 years, it's generated nearly $54 million uh, for wildlife conservation in the state of Utah. Um, here's a graph showing the number of conservation permits issued annually uh, from 2001 to 2019. So on the x-axis, we have the, the year, and the y-axis is the number of permits. And from 2001 to 2006, saw a pretty good increase in permits. Um, and then from 2006 to 2012, it, it declined to, to just over 300. And since then, we've been pretty stable um, from about uh, 2012 to, to current. Um, the participating conservation organizations that we had in, in fiscal year 2019 were the Mule Deer Foundation, National Wild Turkey Foundation, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, or I'm sorry, National Wild Turkey Federation, uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Safari Club International, Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife, and Utah Wild Sheep Foundation. And um, uh, over this last year, as, as the report highlights, um, just a great partnership, and we're, we're really grateful for what these organizations do for wildlife in Utah. Um, if you look at the conservation permit funds raised in Utah uh, from 1980 to 2019, um, you can see uh, over the first two decades, we generated just over 2.5 million in, in those 20 years. And starting in 2001, um, we've been climbing steadily up until last year where we exceeded $4.5 million in revenue. And this year we dipped a little bit and we're just shy of $4.5 million uh, that was raised this year for wildlife conservation in Utah. Um, highlighting some of the accomplishments, and I, I don't think one or two slides really uh, does justice to the the, the tremendous amount of work that was done. But for the wildlife side, we captured nearly 1,300 big game animals um, this year. This year, um, A lot of this was associated with monitoring purposes, um, a transplant here and there, um, and, a, and a lot of it was just trying to uh, get body condition scores and movements and survival rates and all the things that come with, with tracking and monitoring wildlife in the state of Utah. Um, one project in particular was the deer survival. Um, we've been doing that for about a decade. And it has completely changed how we, we manage and understand mule deer in the state. And so appreciative of, of the money that was raised for that. Also, the Book Cliffs Projects, which is one of, of many in the migration initiative, where we've radio collared deer and elk and bison and um, um, cougars and bears and, and those types of things on that unit to better understand uh, the dynamic of all those populations on a, on a unit like the Book Cliffs that is severely uh, limited by summer range. Um, and then just a, a highlight for the migration initiative. We were able to do some fascinating things throughout the state to better understand movements and uh, migration routes of, of big game. Um, switching gears to the habitat side of things, um, guzzlers seem to be a pretty big highlight this year. We had some on Lofer Mountain that were replaced with the fires, which really helped um, with the wildlife and, and the agriculture that use those guzzlers up there, uh, the livestock. and. Also on the Newfoundland Mountains, this is a range that in the summer months, all the bighorn sheep congregate on the north end of the mountain because they're, they're limited by how far they can go from water. And as we've put guzzlers further south down that mountain, um, we've seen uh, the habitat use and, and the home ranges of these animals expand. And so this was another great partnership with the conservation organizations and some great things for bighorn sheep on that unit. Um, also with deer and elk, we've done some great aspen projects. Uh, another great year for the Monroe Mountain, and also Strawberry Ridge, um, doing some great projects there. Numerous bull hog, hog projects throughout the state, trying to keep up with pinion and juniper encroachment on a lot of our, our ranges. 
And then the shrub restoration projects. We've had several of these. Um, and these are, we love these because they're, they involve our, our sportsmen, the conservation organizations, the volunteers, the dedicated hunters, all the people that come and are able to, to plant a, a shrub in the ground and that'll, that'll help mule deer for generations. Um, and with that, that's the annual report. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. That's a very good overview of what really goes on in the state and how much that money helps to get things done. On uh, that money that was raised, that doesn't include Pittman-Robertson money or any other matches that we get to no. increase that number for all these projects and stuff. And it doesn't, and that's that's one thing we've highlighted in previous reports, but um, the, the conservation permit money also oftentimes serves as a match, three to one, so for every dollar raised, if it's matched with Pittman-Robertson dollars, it, it's three more dollars going to wildlife conservation, which, which is huge. So. Any questions from the board? I have one card, Troy. You want to come up? I'm good, Clarence. You're good? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. We have one conservation permit variance request, Darren DeBlois. I've got to figure out where this arrow goes when it's not on this computer. almost as much brain power as I can muster. I'd just like to echo um, what a great program the conservation program is. It's, it's really allowed us to ramp up our efforts in the mammals program. Uh, we've, we've really gotten a lot more callers out and we're learning a lot of fascinating things. Um, apparently I can't talk and do this at the same time. So, uh, but occasionally when we make decisions uh, for wildlife, it comes into conflict with, with these permits. And so today I wanted to present a, a variance request to the board. Um, Kenny actually mentioned this. Um, all right. I got like two slides and I can't manage to uh, work it. Uh, we, we did make a change uh, during the Cougar recommendation cycles this summer uh, to, on the Chalk Creek Camas unit. Those were a combined, those units were combined for hunting purposes in the past. Um, we've had some real concerns on the Chalk, Chalk Creek unit with uh, livestock issues, depredation, as well as some, some uh, wildlife concerns. And since that unit's largely private land, we recommended that we split those units and make the Chalk Creek a harvest objective unit so landowners could go purchase permits over the, the counter essentially and, and deal with some of those concerns. And, uh, and the canvas remained at limit entry. Um, the upshot of that is the Wild, Wild Turkey Federation had that tag and the, that essentially makes the Chalk Creek portion of that tag not very valuable because that's a tag someone could go buy over the counter. And so uh, what we're recommending is that we change that, that permit and just make it valid on the CAMAS unit, which remains a limited entry unit that will affect the value of that permit and, and we'll make adjustments with the, with the organization on, on what that means for them. But, um, but that's our recommendation today. Thank you. Questions from the board? Questions from the rack chairs? I'll make a motion that we accept that as presented. I'll second it. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Kenny, you're back up. Twice for me is very exciting. Do you guys need to take five? Are you good? We're kind of setting a record, so. I'm through it. In our seats a while. Okay. This one literally don't blink on this one. So this is just a, an item we added. The, the department recently went through a legislative audit. I feel like we're getting audited day in, day out, all the time, 24-7. This was a legislative audit of the department. And as, as part of it, one of the reviews was um, 
a little bit of the division fees. And so let me just get my thoughts here in front of me. Um, one recommendation that came out of it was to have the Wildlife Board review non-resident fees and then report to the legislature on which ones could be increased. I think this group is probably familiar, most, most of us are familiar with the, with the fee process. Historically, what we've done is we'll do an analysis of kind of revenue and expenses, and when we see a need arise, we'll do a, an analysis of our fees and see where it kind of makes sense to adjust fees and, and make up the, the revenue that we need to do to do business. And, and that's typically kind of that July rack time frame somewhere in there, and then we bring that to you guys to look at. Um, so to, to follow their recommendation, what we'd, what we'd like to do is, is begin kind of that analysis up front. Then if it looks like we need to, to do something, make some adjustments, we would just follow our normal fee process and bring you guys something to look at if, if necessary, probably next June, July timeframe. And that's, that's all I had on that one. And would that go into effect a few? So the process is, is uh, the fees usually go into effect after the session meets. So after the legislative session. The following year's the session. The following fiscal year. Mm -hmm. So we would, we would do the analysis and kind of look at, at revenue and expenses. And then if, if, we, if it looked like we needed to do something, we'd just plan on, on following mm -hmm. our traditional, very publicly vetted process for, for for looking at, at fees and then bring it, bring you guys something to look at if, if that were the case. One question I get the most is why don't we charge as much as the other states for non-residents? It's a valid question, right? But it's kind of a, it's kind of a balancing act. I don't know. I, I think you look at the surrounding states and some of their trajectories aren't the same as ours. And, and I think some of those decisions, the, the easy place to go shake the tree and get money is, is everybody else's non-residents. Um, we kind of like the recipe we've had. It, it, it seems to attract people. It doesn't, doesn't break the bank, but it still provides us the revenue we need to, to cover our costs. And so I think there's always a rush to, to beat up on non-residents, you know, both, both directions. Um, and so, yeah, if, if needs arise, that's definitely a place we would look to, to generate some more some more revenue it, understanding the balance of not pricing them not pricing them back to their home state any other questions from the board back chairs thanks kenny thank you Casey. I am Stacy Coons and I'm the Wildlife Board Coordinator. I think you guys are trying to make up time for your last meeting. I don't think you're gonna be here till eight o'clock. Um, I am here to present the 2020 RAC Board meeting dates. Um, I won't go through each of the dates because they were all in your packet and we've stayed pretty similar to what we've done in the past with just a couple of exceptions. So if I could point those out really quick. The meeting for January, which is normally January 9th, it's on a Thursday, we will have to move that to January 7th, which is a Tuesday to accommodate those traveling to Winter Wafwa. So there's one adjustment there. Um, I did receive a request from the Central Region Iraq um, to move the August board meeting back a week so that the archers could enjoy their full week. Um, not basically because of their request, but because of the time frame for next year, we were actually able to accommodate that one. So I'll take that one as a win. So we did shift that back one week. So you'll have that August 27th now. And then the last one is we are the, the host state for summer Wafwa next year, which will be July 9th through the 14th. And we are extending invitations to all seven board members to attend that. Um, as part of the Wafwa host state, we are trying to emphasize our partnerships throughout this. So I'm going to do a shameless plug right now for all of our partnerships who would like to be a part of the sponsorship of the conference. Um, we have lots of spaces where we could have sponsorships, where we could um, use your support and your help. So if you're interested in that, um, please reach out to Tour or I. We've also already started reaching out to other groups to cover some of it, but it's gonna be pretty spectacular. And if I was a member of your group, I'd probably wanna make sure we were included in it. So just saying, it's gonna be pretty cool. So July 9th through the 14th, if you'll put that on your, it will be in Park City um, and it's gonna be a lot of fun. So I'm here to, oh, the other thing we did, um, we're able to move some rack tours slightly 
to accommodate for Jeep Week and most spring breaks. We couldn't accommodate all of you, but um, we did the best we could. So those are the dates for next year if you'd like to approve them. Any questions from the board? Great job. Hey, thanks. Everybody's happy. Nobody dares question it. <laughs> I'll take either one. <laughs> when will you have the agenda out for that meeting in July? Um, it should Waffle. be for Wafwa. Usually hits right about the time the registration will open. Um, we don't control all of that exactly. So um, I would expect probably April, May ish, you'll start to see what it looks like. And the gentleman sitting next to me is the new president for Wafwa, Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. So he is. Uh, give Mike a. Thank you I for taking that, that position. Yeah. A lot of work, I know that, to just do that and plus everything else that uh, Mike is charged with. He does a great job for us. Other questions or? Just need a motion. Need a motion. I'll, I'll make the motion to approve the dates with the adjustments that Stacy. I'll second that. Motion and a second. By a raise of hands. Great. Yeah, Miss Stacy, thank you. Thank you. Wildlife Board stipulations, Greg Hansen. Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, Greg Hansen, Utah Attorney General's Office. Um, I just have one last item on your agenda, and it is a stipulation and proposed order on the uh, big game hunting privileges for Mr. Craig B. Cowan. Um, in fall of 2018, Mr. Cowan held an antlerless elk permit uh, that was valid for the Little Red Creek Cooperative Wildlife Management Unit. Um, during his hunt, he shot at multiple different groups of elk uh, without sufficiently investigating whether each of those shots uh, hit its intended target. And, in the course of tagging his cow elk, it was also discovered that uh, a second cow elk was killed and a spike elk was lethally wounded. Um, the division cited Mr. Cowan uh, with an unlawful take, a Class B misdemeanor. Uh, he eventually pled guilty to that through a, a plea in abeyance um, this spring and went through our informal hearing process wherein he was given a 24-month suspension of his big game privileges. Uh, he timely appealed that uh, hearing officer's decision, which brings it before you today. Um, through the, the course of um, handling the appeal, uh, the division, myself and Mr. Cowan were able to reach uh, a negotiated settlement um, for a suspension period of 20 months. Um, and we have a, a signed stipulation from Mr. Cowan and our chief of law enforcement uh, indicating that both parties agree to that, that suspension period. Um, so with that, I would submit that for your consideration. Uh, the 20-month 20, 20 suspension will become effective upon your, your approval and signing of the order. Any questions? Yeah, I guess that's, that's one year for each unlawful take. Is that kind of the way that they got the 24 months to begin with? Um, so suspension periods are, max suspension periods are identified in statute. Uh, he was cited with a single class B of unlawful take, which would have been eligible for a maximum of a three year suspension. Um, the division during the informal hearing officer process uh, recommended a 24 month suspension, uh, so less than the statutory maximum. Um, when we looked at the suspension dates, a 24 month suspension would have in effect took him out, of, taken him out of three drawing periods just based on uh, when he came off suspension, he would have missed that big game drawing the subsequent spring. So um, we felt it was uh, fair and reasonable to drop down to 20 months, still out of two big game drawings. No more questions, I'll accept a motion. Make a motion to uh, accept the presentation. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I'll um, get your signature after the meeting. Okay. Thanks, Greg. 
Uh, the only other business we have is uh, Wafa. Is there anything else you'd like to say about that? Mike, would you? Uh, no, no. Well, I'll just jump in. Um, we're we're hosting the midwinter waffle meeting as well, but we're hosting that in Monterey, California, and uh, it's been requested that we send two board members. Uh, I'm okay with that. We we can make that happen. Uh, you all just need to decide which two board members you want to send. You want us? To you don't have to vote on them. You just need to decide. Let Stacy know. Yeah, and let Stacy know okay. who's going to go. But since we're hosting, I think it's appropriate that we have two board members attend that winter, midwinter meeting. So with the people that notified you, Stacy, do we have enough there? Or do we need? What is the board like today? I guess that people that volunteered. With the volunteers. And with that, I guess we're officially done, Stacy. I'd just like to thank everybody for coming today and the uh, presentations that you made. And Need a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chairman, I move we adjourn. All those in favor? Unanimous? Tried to make up for last time. <laughs>